Prime Minister, um, Indonesia will hold elections in July, presidential elections. How do you see the post uh, Yudhoyono era, for example, in terms of economic policy? And secondly, how do you see the uh, political deadlock in Thailand playing out? Do you see it being resolved soon? Well, I think we've had 10 years of stability and growth in Indonesia under President Yudhoyono. And uh, it's been a great benefit to Indonesia. It's been a great benefit to Indonesia's neighbors. And Indonesia has enhanced its standing in the world as a member of the G20. It plays a role in many international affairs. Uh, we hope that whoever comes after President Yudhoyono will have the same, will establish the same standing and have the same uh, mindset and international outlook to fit Indonesia into an ASEAN and an international uh, environment in a way which will benefit Indonesia and also make your neighbours prosper. Um, I do not know who is going to win the elections. If you look at the popularity polls, Jokowi is uh, the most popular of the candidates. But it's still several steps down the road yet. But whoever it is will have to deal with the same challenges of creating jobs and growth within Indonesia, of holding a complicated country together, uh, which uh, has very different parts between Java and Jakarta and, and in Sumatra or West, West Papua. It's, not, uh, it's even more different than the United Kingdom by, many, by an order of magnitude. And if we can do that, then we can continue on a good path. Uh, Thailand is a very difficult situation for Thailand. Um, it used to be said that Thailand was the one country in Southeast Asia which was a natural nation because it had uh, one race, one religion, one language, one history, and a sense of common destiny. And most of that is true, but I think that sense of common destiny is being tried now because there's a deep divide between the, the Bangkok elite and middle classes and the rural populations, the peasants, who have tasted the fruits of populist policies and are no longer satisfied with the previous trickle-down dispensation. And how to change that back? Because the demonstrators are not asking for elections. In fact, the demonstrators say, if I hold elections, I will lose. Therefore, I don't want to hold elections, but I want democracy. <laughs> oh, that's a difficult circle to square. On the other hand, if you went for elections and you went for the populist policies, that's very hard to sustain too, because in the end, how do you govern a country and run a country without that elite and that pyramid of uh, professionals and, and administrators and, uh, and, and educated people in the capital? So it's a very difficult uh, challenge which the body politic has to solve. Thank you. Uh, lady at the back, on the left-hand side, on my left-hand side. Hi, I'm from the BBC, and I'm just about to go out to... Your name, please. Uh, Carrie Gracie. I'm just about to go out to a job in China, so if you don't mind, can I ask another China question? Um, your um, view on the current anti-corruption campaign in China and what lessons Singapore's experience, notwithstanding the enormous and obvious differences between Singapore and China, uh, are there any lessons that Singapore uh, can help with in terms of China's battle with corruption? I think they're taking this very seriously. If you look at the persons who appear, whom they appear to be investigating, it's going in a very far-reaching way. Nobody knows quite how far-reaching yet, but I think they're taking this very seriously because they know that this is a life-threatening threat, that if they do not clean up corruption, it's not just a matter of administrative inefficiency, but it's the legitimacy and the authority of the Communist Party to rule, and they have to clean up their house or be seen to clean up their house. Now, how to do that without bringing the house down, that is a challenge. But they have to work, they have to act, and they are doing that. What lessons does Singapore hold for them? Well. One is you have to not only be strict on rules and enforcement and on investigation of corrupt people, but you also must set up your system so that you minimize the opportunity for people to be corrupt. The opportunity for arbitrary dis discretion, for, for rent seeking or rent collecting on the part of your officials. Have transparent systems, have disclosure, 
operate in an open basis. <coughs> and if something is not open, well, everybody straight away raises a question mark. And I think to some extent the Chinese are moving in this direction, uh, sometimes unwillingly, but sometimes knowing and knowingly. And the internet is one of the ways which they are using in order to find out what's happening within their own system, because their officials may not tell them, but you can find out by tracking Weibo, Weibo or Weixin, the, 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 the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. And uh, often there's actionable information there. Who's wearing which wristwatch? who was seen in which nightclub, who drives what car. Uh, these are very interesting and significant leads. Uh, the other thing which we have done, which the Chinese have done only to a very limited extent, is we've gone for proper paying people properly and then holding them to account properly also. Because in the old days, the, the, what they said about the communists, at least in the Soviet bloc, is I pretend to pay you and you pretend to work. But here, you really, for civil servants, I will pay you properly and you will do your job properly. And if you don't, you'll be held to account and you'll be replaced or removed or demoted. And then, that, and then there will be integrity in the system. But to get to a position where people have a low trust in uh, the civil servants to one where you will be able to pay them properly and people accept that, I think that's a very difficult journey to travel. And as I said, either you go there progressively, maybe certain parts of the country first, certain cities or provinces, or certain uh, parts of the civil service, such as the Ministry of Finance, or you have a revolution. And I think in China, you have to progress gradually. <laughs>